When VTOL aircraft were introduced in new power in 2020, it was, well, warmly received. Well, less warmly, more heated, especially when the Harrier GR1 debuted at 9.3 with SRAMs. VTOL aircraft in War Thunder have been the bane of the 9.3, 9.7 matchmaker given that they have very insane acceleration, stupid amounts of flares in the case of the AV-8A, and can use its lift jets to maintain flight at very low speed. I think the Harriers were also able to maintain flight on one wing on their flight model for about the longest time. I still maintain that the Harrier GR1 would have made a very nice 9.3 strike fighter had the SRAMs not been introduced for it. But today, we're taking a look at its successors, the AV-8B and the Harrier GR5, GR7 under the collective name Harrier 2. We'll take a look at the Sea Harriers in a different video because those two aircraft act more like interceptors than strike fighters, as you will see later in this video. But without further ado, the Harrier 2. The success of the AV-8A and AV-8C led the US Marine Corps to consider the Harrier as a platform for its light attack fighter requirement for the 1990s. The success influenced the Marine's requirements for the light attack fighter, requiring a total VSTAL light attack force by 1990. After the joint UK-US AV-16 program failed, the AV-8B Advanced Harrier program was proposed in 1973, and Congress formalized it to commence by 1976. Two technology demonstrators were the products of the first phase of the AV-8B Advanced Harrier program. This was followed by two YAV-8B test beds made from upgraded AV-8As. By 1979, the first test bed was deployed on USS Saipan for seagoing trials in 1979, and subsequently, after Congress ordered production of four full-scale development aircraft designated AV-8B, the first testbed joined NASA's test fleet. Twelve production aircraft were ordered, followed by a subsequent limited run of 21. The AV-8B was significantly different from the white AV-8B testbeds. Initially, the production run of AV-8Bs were built by McDonnell Douglas, when the British agreed to a work-share program British Aerospace built the center and rear fuselage along with the fin and rudder and the centerline pylon. The British MOD ordered a batch of 60 Harrier GR5s in 1981 with the MOD requiring the GR5 to use British avionics in lieu of American avionics. The British side of the story was a fairly short one. When the AV-16 collaboration collapsed in 1973, a proposal to give the GR-3 a larger wing to support more weapons was considered. It was originally aimed to carry more weapons in the underwing pylons as well as missiles in the launch rails. By this time, the AV-8B succeeded and the British MOD cancelled the quote-unquote Big Wing Harrier project and instead ordered the AV-8B. Subsequent upgrades of the American and British Harrier 2s focused on one aspect, night attack capability. The AV-8B NA and the AV-8B Plus focus on night vision capabilities in the cockpit as well as forward-looking infrared capability. These upgrades went under service by 1990 and would serve in the Gulf War except for the AV-8B Plus which would be completed by 1992. The Harrier II is a vertical and short takeoff capable strike fighter. It features a longer wingspan than the Harrier I to allow it to carry more weapons. This is distinguishable by the landing gear of the Harrier II being in the middle of the wing instead of the tip. The Harrier is known to use carbon fiber for about 25% of its body weight. Here you can see the composition of the Harrier by materials used. It is powered by the Rolls-Royce Pegasus F404RR406 for the AV-8B and the Pegasus Mark 105 for the GR5 and GR7 which provides around 300 pounds more thrust than the AV-8B's F406. The AV-8B night attack upgrades the engine to the F404 RR408 engines known as the Pegasus Mark 11. These engines are capable of full digital engine control and could turn its nozzles completely variable for vectoring in forward flight. The cockpit of the original AV-8B and GR5 feature a moving map based on its inertial guidance system that is replaced by the digital map on GPS equipped AV-8B Plus and GR7 variants. The original AV-8B had no radar but the AV-8B Plus was fitted with the AN-APG-65Q4 radar, a variant of the APG-65 radar based on the F-18 Horn. This was capable of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground modes and allowed the AV-8B Plus to fire the AMRAM missile. 
the GR5 and GR7 did not carry radar. This radar replaced the Hughes A and ASB-19 angle rate bombing system which provide TV tracking capability. You can tell early AV-8Bs from AV-8B night attack and AV-8B plus variants by their nose. The AV-8B has a notch at the center of its nose on the ASB-19. The night attack variant retains this but includes a notch above its nose for the forward looking infrared system. And the AV-8B plus completely eliminates the center notch on the nose as the ARBS is completely completely replaced by the APG-65 Q4 radar. The GR-5 retains the ARBS notch and the GR-7 the forward-looking infrared notch. The AV-8B's countermeasures consist of the ANALR-67 radar warning system paired with four ANALE-39 chaff and flare dispensers. The Marines recently upgraded the ALR-67 to the ALR-47 V2. Two dispensers firing downward and two dispensers firing upward make up the four A and ALE-39 chaff and flare dispensers. These are placed in the rear fuselage of the AV-8B. The GR-5 and GR-7 featured a Marconi Zeus RWR paired with a Plessy Missile Approach Warning System. The Zeus RWR could automatically deploy chaff and flares once threats are detected. The GR-7 featured a Swedish BOL chaff dispenser in the rear. The GR5 and GR7 could also carry extra chaff dispensers through the FEMAT chaff dispenser pod mounted on the outermost wing pylon. The night vision capability of the AV8B and A, AV8B Plus, and GR7 was made possible through the General Electric Company, the British GEC, not the American GE, forward looking infrared sensor mounted on top of the nose cone. This was complemented by the Cat's Eyes night vision goggles developed for the AV8B and the GEC Nightbird night vision goggles for the GR-7. Both the American and British Harrier IIs use a 25mm rotary cannon mounted on the left ventral streak where one of the guns of the 30mm Aiden used to be on the original Harrier. The American Harrier II's gun was designated the GAU-12 equalizer and the British used a 25mm Aiden rotary gun. The right ventral streak carried the 300 rounds of ammunition for the gun. The ammunition used by the gun was a NATO Stanig 4173 consisting of high explosive, armor piercing, and armor piercing discarding Sabo rounds. It fires at a rate of 3600 rounds per minute and is driven from bleed air from the engine. For air to air armament, all variants of the Harrier II carry AIM 9 Sidewinder variants, particularly the AIM 9L and AIM 9M. The American Harrier IIs carry a maximum of four missiles but the British Harriers can carry a total of six thanks to Sidewinder-only rails in the landing gear outriggers. However, the AV-8P Plus can carry four AIM-120 AMRAMs guided by the AN APG-65 Q4. For ground ordnance, American Harriers can carry up to 1,000 pounds of ordnance per pylon, including dumb bombs and hydro rockets. And AV-8Bs can also carry the AGM-65 E and F. However, the AV-8B could not perform its own laser designation. As a result, only the IR-guided AGM-65F could be fired autonomously. This also eliminates paveway capability of the AV-8B. And this also eliminates the autonomous APKWS capability of the AV-8B, which it received recently. The GR-5 exists in the same capability sphere as the AV-8B, only replacing the Hydras with CRV-7 rockets. The GR-7, however, was certified to fit the T-Alt pod, which allowed it autonomous laser designation capability. This allows it to carry the paveway series of guided bombs and the laser-guided AGM-65E Mavericks on top of the AGM-65F IR-guided Mavericks. The GR-9 upgrade includes um, integration of the Brimstone missile, but I don't think we'll see the GR-9 about soon, I guess. In game, the Harrier 2s present a tough challenge with the current top tier meta and the coming top tier aircraft. More and more agile aircraft are being added and the Harrier 2s are at a severe disadvantage with its subsonic speed and poor maneuver capability. We can see how much lift the F-14A can generate in a dogfight with its wings outstretched. The Harrier 2 will struggle to keep up even when given all aspect sidewinders. The AV-8B Plus will fare better with its four AMRAMs, but that's all it has. 
Merging with aircraft would be difficult as they're equipped with pulse Doppler radars that could start firing sparrows from ranges further than the 9L or the 25mm can probably work with. The amount of countermeasures definitely helped to a certain extent, but with radars like the F4J and the F14s, chaff becomes a thing of the past. It really is just there to make IR missiles more difficult to hit, but that's about it. Hit and run passes from high speed aircraft will be this thing's downfall. At 11.3 or 11.7, where I intend to put these aircraft, it will be just like the A 10. So, for BR placement, I believe the AV 8B, GR 5, and GR 7 should at least be 11.0, with the AV 8B Plus at 11.3 or 11.7 with its 4 AMRAMs. The GR 5 and GR 7 should follow the Jaguar GR 1A, and the AV 8B and AV 8B Plus following the A 7E. Special variants of the AV 8B and Harrier could be the Y AV 8B with only two AIM-9Gs and the 25mm GAU-12 as armament. And for the British, the Harrier GR-5 ZD-402 which featured the upgraded Pegasus 11-61 engine and a special paint job. Speaking of paint jobs, here are some very unique, neat special paint jobs that would be nice to have in-game. The Harrier 2 is a step up from the original Harrier but not by much. New missiles, night vision capability, and AMRAM in the case of the AV-8B Plus is nice, but it's going to come up against F-14As, AIM-7Fs, and AIM-54s, and MiG-23s with R-24s, all of which are faster and more agile than itself. Nevertheless, the Harrier was never meant to dogfight these purpose-built fighters, but rather it was made to provide light strike capabilities with secondary fighter characteristics. Interceptors are more reserved for the Sea Harrier, but anyways, I for one would like to see the Sea Harrier FRS-1 and the Harrier 2 series be added in the near future because they represent a very nice and probably niche part of the military aviation history that I'd like to see represented in game because they would make for really nice ground attackers. As per the usual, thanks for watching. This is the Dr. MD, Godspeed.